My name is Alex Williams, founder of The New Stack, and you're listening to The New Stack Analyst Podcast, a show about application, development, and management at scale. Thanks for joining us. Hey, it's Alex Williams of The New Stack here for a year-end show at Tectonic Summit in New York City. And here with uh, one of the original co-anchors of the show, co-host, uh, Donnie Burkholz of 451 Research. Hey, Donnie. Hey, good to be here. And Joe Jackson, managing editor at uh, The New Stack and uh, oh. now a frequent host on the this, this show as well. And Kyle McDonald, who is an advisor to The New Stack and uh, you know someone who's been in this world a long time. Thanks for joining us, Kyle. Thank you for having me. You bet. So we're going to do things a little bit differently today. We're going we're gonna to actually... Uh, Discuss three different themes, um, and just kind of have a um, you know general conversation about it. So, we're here at Tectonic Summit, and CoreOS announced that they are no longer using the, the term CoreOS Linux, but they're going to instead use Container Linux as a subject as the description of their service. Uh, Docker has announced that they are going to be uh, donating Container D, which is uh, their new runtime. So we're going to discuss that, and then we're going to discuss AWS and open source. So, the first topic, container Linux. Go ahead. Well, just right out of the box, it strikes me that uh, CoreOS with that move is seemingly maybe shifting its emphasis a bit from uh, being an alternative to Docker to, be, to being an alternative to Red Hat. So just, yeah. Because last, last summer at the Red Hat uh, Summit, uh, basically they made the, Red Hat made the argument that, you know, containers are really part of a smaller part of a much larger strategy, and that strategy, it's, it's a feature of Linux, so to speak, rather than its own sort of ecosystem. And so that's kind of what I read into the, uh, uh, this announcement. But I, I've been hearing similar themes uh, from other parties who are, allies with CoreOS. Kelsey Hightower talk about Linux, right? And saying that, you know, there's always going to be a different kind of a container out there, right? And Red Hat has a similar kind of a, of a story, too. It seems like there seems mm -hmm. to be some concerted effort to drive the discussion almost away from containers and more to making it about Linux. Yeah, I mean, you've clearly got a lot of vested interests here and in companies trying to say, hey, this isn't anything revolutionary. This is really just what we've been doing all along. And so, you know, whether it's a Red Hat or whether it's, um, you know, the, the Dell EMC Federation companies or anybody else in the mix, they're all very much interested in saying, hey, a, a container is just a VM with a different twist, right? Uh, you maintain this uh, group of containers just like you maintain a Linux distro, and we've got all this expertise over here, we can apply over there, right? It's all about trying to build enterprise, enterprise credibility and, you know, for the big folks trying to keep up with, with the little startups that are moving a lot faster than they typically can. And I think there's there's a couple of different takes on it, right? So that's one angle. Um, I think, you know, the rename to Container Linux, there's a lot of subtleties in it, right? Because mm -hmm. you've got one, which is saying, this is the standard, right? This is how you do mm -hmm. Container Linux. That's a very Linux. definitive title. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice um, marketing. So, you know, compared to yeah. Red Hat, compared to, you know, Ubuntu, compared to everybody else out there saying, no, this is how you do it, right? Um, and I think it's also interesting, like, putting Linux into it is actually yeah. kind of interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is pulling the, that particular part of, of the CoreOS you know, product and project line back down the stack to very definitively label it as like, this is the OS this particular project is about, right? Whereas before you could have been like, oh, CoreOS on Windows, okay, right, why not? But if it's container Linux, that's clearly not gonna happen. I mean, I, I think the shift out of containers and into Linux for CoreOS on this product is an interesting, is an interesting signal. Um, I think this year we watched the, you know, when you thought of how you were going to deploy containers as an enterprise, you might have had one plan starting in January, you might have had a different plan come uh, end of August, uh, you might have looked at that plan very differently, you know, today, right? And when you think about an enterprise market, you can't have your customers, right? As a developer, as a manager, right, as an enterprise buyer, you can't be changing your mind or looking at your strategy and having them change so much three times, right? So. 
coming back to the Linux world seems fairly straightforward. Yeah. And then the, the other piece of what I find really interesting and, and a little bit concerning is, you know, I've spent a long time in and around open source software, open source foundations, and one of the frequent issues that comes up when you're talking about things like what, what does a foundation do? Um, it handles money, it also handles copyrights and trademarks. Um, Container Linux is a very weak trademark. And I think there's going to be a lot of trouble in defending that kind of trademark, like the kind of challenges that Mozilla has run into over the years, where you get downloads that are being sold of Firefox and some shady third party making money off of it. You know, there's the potential for the same kind of thing here, but it's much less defensible because Container Linux is a generic term, right? It's not a, a term that CoreOS can come up with and say, oh, we're the only company that could possibly do this. It's not unique. Um, so there's, I think, some legal concerns here. Um, hmm. That you know have implications that, that I think haven't really been thought about at this point. Now, is there any sort of significance uh, or not to the? Uh, I know Microsoft has recently really got into the the whole uh, uh, container container bandwagon. In particular, I know uh, Apprentice working on a version of Kubernetes. Well, eventually, to get to Kubernetes to control containers on Windows Server. Uh, though it's in itself, it's still going to run on Linux. And then at the recent Connect uh, conference, uh, Microsoft was all about rolling containers into its own uh, CI/CD pipeline. Is there a kind of stake? Is CoreOS putting a stake in the in the in the ground by saying no? This is containers are about Linux, or is it just everybody's working on uh, Kubernetes right now? It's all happening at the same time. That's a good question. I mean. There's a lot of different perspectives on the sort of containers are about infrastructure, containers are about applications thing. Mm -hmm. right? We huh. heard on the panel this morning, the yeah. Kubernetes panel, where you had um, you know Jonathan Donaldson from Intel saying containers are an app or Kubernetes is an application layer thing. Um, OpenStack is an infrastructure layer thing, right? And containers is kind of the meeting point. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be the case for um, a lot of different groups. And you know, as this whole sort of DevOps thing is hitting the mainstream now. Right, you've got to figure out what is the meeting point for all of these different groups involved, um, application, infrastructure, security, QA, um, across the business. And I think from a technological perspective, um, the meeting point is containers. All right? And that's increasingly the way going forward. And right now, it tends to be a lot of forklifted apps, but it's moving toward you know, cloud-native applications, microservices, whatever you want to call them. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of you know, vendor participation coming from different angles to handle different aspects of that problem. Right, and CoreOS is, I think, very, as you say, very purposefully positioning to say, we're going to handle the infrastructure part of that problem um, as with you know, container Linux. And then mm -hmm. the question is, so what about the rest of it? Hmm. Um, and there's a lot of different vendors trying to address different parts of that, whether it's you know, security scanning of containers, um, container networking. You know, we've got um, like Tegera here who's pushing things like Calico and Flannel and so on. Is this a common way for both developer and ops to better understand, you know, what, what this means in some respect. Is there some subtlety there in the, uh, you know, in, 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 in the description? Yes. I mean, I think if you, if you are a developer and you've been trying to figure out how to put containers to work and what exactly containers look like in your, in your developer workflow, and, and let's face it, that outside of Silicon Valley and sort of a couple of bleeding edge cases, what we're really talking about is you know, in 2017, that market finally becoming mature enough that they can really start to put those to work. Container Linux might be the first tangible way to associate those two things that, you know, starts to become mainstream. That's really interesting. Is this self-driving Container Linux, what we're talking about here? You know, that we also heard this term around self-driving. Oh, so there was a self-driving and there's self-hosted, which self are two slightly, subtly different things. But, uh, yeah, uh, one of the announcements that uh, CoreOS made made this week is, you know, their, their version of Kubernetes can now uh, update itself, basically using the tools within Kubernetes, which makes it easier to, for admins who previously had to write scripts or do this stuff manually. Now they can apply their Kubernetes expertise and automating the Kubernetes update. And, uh, you know, Kubernetes, as it gets update, well, well it, there's no downtime either. It can, like CoreOS, the original CoreOS, now container Linux, it can update itself with no downtime. So, uh, uh, yeah, that, that seems to be the direction that uh, this technology is headed in. Well, I guess we'll have to find out whether this is actually, you know, just a name or, or, or you know, what this actually means.
let's uh, move on to our next topic, and that's container D. And Docker has spun out its core container runtime component, and we are just starting to understand what this story is all about. But Joe, can you give us a, a brief on what this is? Yeah, uh, I can tell you what little I know. I'm supposed to talk with Docker later on today. Uh, but basically, uh, Container D is, is Docker's new. It, it's their current uh, core container runtime component, and it's already open source. But what they want to do is uh, release it to a uh, vendor, a, a kind of neutral standards body. They specifically didn't call out OCI specifically, but they will use the OCI standard and uh, when uh, OCI 1.0, uh, uh, the runtime, that's available, sh I guess, early next year, uh, it will be OCI uh, compliant. Now, uh, from what I understand, uh, the container D is built on run C, which is the uh, OCI standard. Uh, I'm not, I'm so, like I said, I'm supposed to talk to them later on today, uh, but I'm, I'm still not, uh, they, they're making a big deal with this. I'm still not understand, fully understand the significance uh, of this announcement. I don't know, Donnie, have you thought about it at all in terms of what, what they're trying to do here? Yeah, I think there's a few important trends involved, right? And I talked to them uh, a day or two ago, mm -hmm. and the story I got was basically, look, this is a continuation of the ongoing work we've been doing toward increasingly modularizing um, all of Docker, right? The entire software stack for containers all the way up and down, right? And Run C was the start of it, which in many ways was driven by vendor pressure from CoreOS and others, since we're at the CoreOS uh, Tectonic Summit here. And, you know, in some ways, like, we've seen that continuing of Docker, the company, trying to ensure that it can keep up with the broader ecosystem out there, because there's a lot of startups, everything's moving fast, everybody's trying to add value on top of it. And so you saw a couple months ago, you know, Red Hat kind of pushing um, the idea, can we pull in just run C into Kubernetes? Right, as sort of a response to mm -hmm. Docker bundling Swarm into the core Docker release. Mm -hmm. And now, in many ways, this helps address um, some of the bundling challenges there and some of the concerns that we heard from the community, which are, one, um, you're bundling too much stuff. Right. Right. Two, you are adding brand new stuff into what's being branded as a stable release. Um, and both of those things created a lot of uh, complaints, concerns from enterprise users of saying, look, we need something stable. But the Facebook logo or motto from you know, a few years back was move fast and break things, and now it's move <laughs> fast with stable infra. Uh -huh. I, mean, I think there's an interesting, if you think about this, right, going back to you know, what we were just talking about with container Linux and sort of that evolution, this, this sort of fits into that, into that area, right? We're starting to see how you know, we had a container runtime you know, at the beginning of the year that lasted through the year. Container D really is, at least from the Docker perspective, things it gives them the, the VMware-like capabilities that they like to tout in a lot of their enterprise uh, plays, things like live migration, right? And so to have those that set of functionality that they've been providing as part of their enterprise story now in sync with OCI or OCC, that's a really interesting, like that's, that's setting up 2017 to be a great year for a developer because it means that those two things are back to being in sync and that there's a model for keeping them in sync, right? So frankly, that's a that's a really strong move, I think, on the Docker, you know, front, and I think that also sets up a very interesting dynamic change in the container market, where these are now no longer opposing forces, but frankly, it's going to be a story about how to get them on track together. Is this going to quell talk of a Docker fork? Oh, it's certainly going to do a lot to address that. Huh. I mean, there's always concerns coming up about oh, we're going to fork it, we're going to fork it, we're going to fork it, right? Huh. And it's always hard to nail down. Did these talks happen, or what's going on? Is, is this something that's real, or is this just you know the ongoing concerns of uh, you know un unspoken <laughs> interests in the community, or whatever it happens to be? Right. It was really interesting, uh, Donnie, when you talked about Docker and their approach. You know, kind of being around modularizing Docker, right? And and I hear that word modularizing, and I think of a lot of different things. But one of the things that is coming very clear out of this, right, is that that modularity is giving them the flexibility. The question is, what do you fork now, right? Are you forking a specific module? All right, that's a very frank, upfront discussion. That's a very different thing than sort of having to fork the large blob that we were 
you know, when you talked about it six to 12 months ago. What, is, what, what impact does this have on OCI? Does it have any impact on OCI? Um, I think it's it's largely a good thing, right? Like Containerd is, is consuming Run C internally, the OCI standard. Um, and so it's going to help perpetuate that. Like the more container D gets out there, the more um, run C gets out there. Uh-huh. Right? And the two are, and it, there are, I think, some interesting potential threats in there in that if the standard becomes something that's, let's say, only internally facing, it, it's no longer an interesting standard. Right? If container D is the unit of modularity, then who cares about how container D talks to itself? Right. right. Um, and so now you you start to wonder, all right, well, that's not the standard that matters anymore. The standard that matters now is the container D API, mm-hmm. right? And what does that look like, and where does that live? Right. And, and they've talked about, you know, finding the right home for this. It's not OCI, though, do we, or do we not know? Well, when I spoke to them, they basically said, look, we're trying to get community input on this. We've got a lot of ideas, um, but we don't want to do community by fiat, right? We're trying to do this right and mm-hmm. understand where the community wants to tend up, which kinds of foundations it might be, whether it, it's a new one or one of the many existing ones, you know, like Cloud Native Compute Foundation is, is a potential, um, any of the large ones, you know, Apache, Linux Foundation, and so on. So is this an effort to do an end run around OCI in some respects? Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And because, you know, standards, I mean, they inevitably slow things down. And so it's always a little bit nicer to uh, control your own standard. <laughs> well, I think things change when you go from defining the standard to having to match the standard, right, and build to a standard. Nice. Great. Great. Well, let's, uh, I think that settles the discussion for now, at least, on Container D. Our third topic is AWS and open source. We're following a... Uh, uh, AWS reInvent was just happened just a few weeks ago, and uh, AWS is talking more about open source. Is it real? Is it not? What do you guys think? Uh, my take is it's it's very real as far as I can tell at this point. I mean, we've seen Amazon. Let's say two years ago, you would say they are very inimical to open source. Right? They hate the stuff. They're not going to open source any of their own stuff. They won't talk about whether they even pulled open source projects in house to build their own their products. Um, but things have gradually started to change, right? And it started with, as it often does, uh, you know, SDKs, integrations, that kind of stuff. Um, but it's, that road has gradually been changing, right? They open sourced um, some machine learning software. They've open sourced uh, some TLS software, right? And that was actually, what I think, the first example was a piece of TLS software they open sourced a while back. And now they've got blocks, right? Which is very interesting in the context of this discussion because you know, what's happening here is everybody, I think, assumed, oh, Amazon's going to go in on Kubernetes, right? Because everybody else has in the past year. So, right. of course, that's going to be the way they, they go. But instead, they did something totally different. Um, they b- built out their own project, right, or series of projects to provide, you know, equivalent functionality. So uh, that's a, Is a, it equivalent? Is it, really it will be. Yeah. It's not there yet. Like, right now, it's minimal scheduling. It's yeah. not the whole yeah. spectrum. So it's a scheduler, but I take it they want input at for additional functionality from the outside or they'll put up the scaffolding and no others fill in what they need or is that the general idea of blocks I guess um, yeah I think so and I mean they've got you know they hired Adrian Cockroft recently right mm-hmm. who was at battery ventures and previously a chief architect at Netflix so he's got deep credibility in cloud um, and just a week ago they hired um, Zahida Borat who's got a deep history in open source from uh, Salesforce Google Open Source Office, um, back to the Sunday, she was one of the key people behind Open Office. Well, okay. Right, and so they're seriously investing in, in doing this right and not doing, you know, throw it over the fence style open source and instead doing, you know, very community driven participatory open now, source. Now, do, do you, are you familiar with the kind of like the, you know, the chain of command here at AWS and like who does Adrian report to? Do you know? That's a really good question. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd be curious on that. Um, be, because I mean, one of the things I've heard is that yes, they are very, very serious about it, um, and you know. But I, I'm just trying to, you know, do we really have any idea what that actually means? That you know how serious well, I mean, they are. They, they are 100 percent, I would say, dependent on open source. Right? They have built open source into so many different parts of the AWS infrastructure, at least that we from the outside world can see. Right? things as simple as Amazon Linux, right, which is powering a lot of their, you know, data stuff. 
Um, a lot of their services, like the, they offer a MySQL uh, equivalent service, uh, they offer a Postgres equivalent service, e even they offer open source software in various guises. Yeah, that they're heavily reliant on it. Yeah, so to the, yeah. to the extent that internally within a business at Amazon, I looked, you know, if you were to look at this as a manager of Amazon and say, uh, you know, what are the biggest risks to my business, right? Any slowdown in the open source ecosystem could have a massive impact. Right or change, frankly, in investment patterns on who's developing and where they're developing in that open source ecosystem. Right, because you, as Amazon, you know, you're offering this as a service now. You're reliant on that developer pool to continue advancing, fixing, and patching it. And if not, then you're going to be doing it yourself. Right, mm -hmm. and so for them, you know, I would say open source has got to be probably, you know, square on the agenda, staring them in the face. Whether that comes in the form of we need to add investment to help development happen in certain projects, and so we need to work with certain companies to get that done, right? The mechanisms by which they're, they're managing that open source, that I think we're seeing change. I think that's what Blocks looks mm -hmm. like to the outside world. It, it's funny though that, um, well, it's funny, but at the same time, it's obvious that they, why they didn't go with Kubernetes is because you know, it's Google, it's Google's born at Google anyway, but also Kubernetes, uh, is actually uh, has the threat of commoditizing cloud services because right now there's no way of sharing doing a workload across two different cloud services. Kubernetes might be an easy way of doing that, and so Blocks seems to be well, you know, it's an answer that well, this yeah, this is not Kubernetes; it's something else. I don't know how you could use Blocks outside of AWS. So I, I I've been asking myself why are you know why are they doing this? And one of the theories I have is like. They've built up enough of a market right now. They're, they're that strong enough where they this is the, they they can do this right. You no, know, and now they can offer this as kind of this supplemental mm -hmm. this supplemental thing. You know, um, you know to make them more amenable. I, I'm I'm wondering. You know, though, do we have any idea to what extent they're going to do this? I mean, you know, is Lambda going to be open sourced? Is it you know are they going to like uh, you know does this mean new things for? You know, you know, for for how they view, you know, their 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 whole, their, you know, their whole offerings. I mean, do you have any clue on, you know, how how far they're going to take this? Yeah, I think it's it's hard to have a clue, but you can think about like Kyle pointed out about what what's the rationale for all this stuff and kind of speculate based on that, which is how do they get more people running more stuff, more basic infrastructure right. and data services on their cloud, right? Because that's that's what they're making money off of right now is data and compute, right? Um, probably data more so than anything else. Um, and everything else is, is pull through, right? Mm -hmm. Like you look at um, new software like X-Ray or um, Stuck Functions, all of this stuff is, is trying to figure out how do we get more core workloads or more brand new workloads. Here, we'll send you an entire car. truck. Fill up the truck full of yeah. <laughs> data and we'll... Yeah, yeah. And, and so now they've got, um, you know, Lambda Edge, right? You can run Lambda Functions in a CDN. Um, you can get the, the suitcase, the snowball, yeah. and Lambda <laughs> stuff on there in your own data center if you want to. But at the end of the day, it's all about how do you get that stuff gradually migrating into the public cloud. Um, and so would an open source Lambda do that? I don't think so, uh, because they've already now got um, something that you can run on-prem. And that was that's the same benefit an open source Lambda would provide. Mm -hmm. um, and the challenge, if that were to happen, is well, now any service provider out there could provide um, not just a Lambda-like functionality, but Lambda itself. And I don't think that's something that would be in their best interests. How does this, how does this affect the open source community overall? Does it have any kind of larger impact that, you know, that, we, that we can see? Um, and I'm also curious about the existing AWS ecosystem uh, that seems to you know, get a little, you know, well, it's not just seems, it, it gets, you know, Eaten up piece by piece by you know by AWS every time it comes around yeah. to this time of year when we hear Werner on stage <laughs> at reInvent talking about what you know what they're doing stuff now. Yeah. right which yeah. sets of startups are now obsolete yeah yeah um, I think so with with Block in particular you know, it's definitely introducing additional fragmentation yeah. into the container orchestration and management ecosystem yeah. mm -hmm. which is going to create more confusion right. on the part of end users um, right. which is going to cut market share of everybody and so you know how does that boil down well it, it looks like, uh, well, this is so confusing, we'll just go to our cloud provider, right? Or we'll just go to some trusted vendor. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the, those who are most affected are probably um, the startups and not so much established vendors. Because the more confusion there is, the more people are going to look to somebody they trust. 
Well, I think that about sums up our discussion for today. We discussed uh, CoreOS Linux, which is now Container Linux. We discussed uh, Docker's uh, Container D and what are the implications of that and AWS and open source. Great discussion, guys. I, I, I like this format. This is a lot of fun. Donnie Burkholz, thank you very much for joining us. Have a, have a great holidays and we'll see you in the new year. Joe, as usual, you know, thanks for being part of all this whole new stack thing we're doing and these podcasts have been a lot of fun and Kyle, always love to have you on the show. So hope to see you here again soon. So that that's a wrap from here at the Tectonic Summit. I'm Alex Williams. We'll, we'll be back again soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye. My name is Alex Williams, founder of The New Stack, and you're listening to The New Stack Analyst Podcast, a show about application development and management at scale. Thanks again, and I hope to see you back at the show. Bye-bye.